Here we are again, students. This is Dr. Winkler again. We are discussing the First World War for the World War I class. This is lecture number 12. And I hope that you're enjoying your day. I certainly am. We're going to have some more fun today. Remember what we were discussing last time. <clears throat> We were done discussing the Armenian massacres, and now we're discussing Italy and the war. Remember, Italy has certain disadvantages when it's trying to make itself a major political and major military power, and that's simply a lack of heavy industry. It simply does not have the natural resources, it doesn't have a lot of coal, doesn't have a lot of iron for them to develop heavy industry. Because of this, Italy does have a tendency to try to have to buy their, their coal, their iron, and the materials that are produced from these. So Italy is not a strong nation as far as military prowess is concerned, simply because they don't have the manufacturing background, which is necessary to have a large and effective military. As I'm going to point out, there's also an issue here where a lot of the men realize the men they're going to fight for Italy, realize that there is really no good reason why they've gone to war. They haven't been attacked. Quite frankly, they haven't even been effectively threatened. So what they decide, so the, when the men are going up, they're saying we're fighting for another mountain pass, which is absolutely true. We're fighting for some land on the Dalmatian coast. More often than we're fighting for the honor of Italy. Uh, as part of this is to get even with their old nemesis, their old enemy, Austro Aust the Austrian Empire. Well, the Italians are caught in a terrible situation if you're trying to fight this war. How many places can you actually fight when you're fighting against, let's pull a map up here, when you're fighting against the Austrians? This is Zonzo, this is Zonzo River. We're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. You see where we're at, Italy, uh, this area right here, which at that time was facing the Austrian Empire. Go back to our other map. These are the Alps. The Alps, as you know, they start over in France. Very, very formidable mountain range, very high, very steep. You see, a lot of the Alps have been formed by glaciation. If you, I'm from Utah, most of you probably are as well. You simply look up at the Wasatch Range, for example, and you see some very high mountains. But these mountains formed in a relatively dry area. In the last glaciation, there is some glaciers over in the Uinta Mountains. If you go over there, sometimes these mountains can be quite steep. As we look up at the Wasatch Range, which are very impressive mountains, believe me, but we tend to see, because of a lack of glaciation, they, as steep as they are, the angle of repose for the Wasatch is not as steep as it could be in the Alps. The Alps are extremely impressive. You go there, and rather than having an angle repose, they, you have cliff faces that are almost vertical. Some of these things are enormously impressive, carved out by uh, glaciers over a very lengthy period of time. Perhaps the most famous of this is the Matterhorn. I'm sure you've all seen numerous uh, images of the Matterhorn. You see, it it's, it's, looks like a citadel, does it not? In fact, it looks like there were glaciers, and there were, on either side of this that carved this down. This is like a 14,000-foot mountain. This is extremely high. Well, there are mountains like Mont Blanc in France that are actually higher. But you do get an idea of what glaciation can do to the Alps. The Alps are higher than the Rocky Mountains. They're higher than the Wasatch Range, and they are carved much more steeply. Therefore, they are very formidable. 
as far as a position is concerned, you want to you want to take these things by assault. Much easier to defend, much harder to take. So let's go back to our maps here. These are Alps. Now <clears throat> I've been to Austria, I've been to Switzerland. I've seen the Alps there. They will knock your eye out. What I have not been is over in this area to see what the Alps look like here. Looking at photographs, however, get a good idea of a topographical map. You do see that these are very formidable places. Well, the boundary between Austria and Italy largely at that time is along here. Yeah, we're going to see combat. Get off this, okay. Not exactly what I was hoping to see. You find that one of the very few places where the Italians can actually attack the Austrians without having to literally go up the face of these extremely formidable mountains. I mean, the plains down here are very low. They're, they're pretty, very close to sea level. Just within a short distance, now you see mountains that are thousands of feet high, almost vertical. So where can you actually attack? We do see combat over here. But where can we actually attack? Where you're not exactly pounding in to the Austrian Alps. The Isonzo River right along here. Of course, there's combat in other places as well. There's other offensives. These are very, very challenging. <clears throat> I mean, the, the old... Do I have any photographs of the battles of Azonzo? You're up on the side of mountains, extremely steep. I guess we have another map here to give you an idea as to the nature of the topography. It's very high. I have seen newsreel footage, photography of men that are literally on cliff faces, where you somehow you knock in or, or be able to get a machine gun position or a place where you can put a few men, but the slopes are extremely steep. This is very easy for defense. You're shooting down on your enemies. It's very, very difficult to attack because you have to, somehow you have to figure out how to neutralize that, and then you have to figure out how to take those positions. Uh, very, very challenging to say the least. Well, the only viable front is the Zonzo. And so the Italians attack here over and over again. It's enormously frustrating. It depends on how you want to count the battles. In the period of 1915 to 1917, two years, the Italians are going to stage 11 major assaults on the Isonzo. You see, you divide two years by 11, you're having major assaults about every two, three months. Uh, essentially, what, what ends up being is this. The Italians attack heavy losses, little gain, you grab a few, few square miles, uh, and then you're going to try it again. Of course, the Austrians are going to counterattack. It's going to be other combat going on down here. In these initial 11 battles, the uh, Italians lose hundreds of thousands of men to accomplish practically nothing. Because in, in this area is so defensible, the Austrians suffer much smaller casualties than do the Italians. Because the Italians, of course, are attacking very vulnerable positions. Now, notice what I have here. I have 11 battles of Isonzo. Some people want to call it 12. The 12th battle is the uh, counterattack. See, the 11 battles here are Italian offenses. Can I get a better map? The, uh, the <clears throat> these are Italian offenses. Now, the 12th battle, which we tend to call the Battle of Carparetto, you can call it the 11th, 12th Battle of the Sons if you want to, but we tend to call it the Battle of the Carparetto when the Austrians and the Germans counterattack. And this time they break the Italian front and actually 
are able to push way down here. Now, I'll talk later about the almost dissolution, the almost destruction of the Italian army in 1917. That's a little bit beyond our, our time frame, however. But I do want you to know we're talking about 11 or 12 battles. Now, in all fairness to the Italians, this seems like enormously foolish. It really is foolish, I believe. But perhaps it's not as bad as sometimes we portray it. For example, you have attacks and you attack for a few weeks. Then you call off for a few months and you attack again. In other major battles, let's use the Battle of the Somme 1916, for example, when the British and her allies attack German positions. And they attack them for a couple of weeks and then they, haul it, then they call it off for a few more weeks. And then they do it again. So we have intense combat, and we have breaks, intense combat, and breaks. But we still call it one battle, the Battle of the Somme. It, would it be fair if we don't call this 11 battles of Isonzo, 11 major issues, uh, major, major time frames of attack? Are we going to call this one battle that runs for over two years? What else can you do? You try to control the Adriatic, the sea right here, with the Italian Navy down here. However, this is more easily controlled by the Austrians. So, uh, the, since the Italians don't control this, any idea of taking a, a naval force, probably with the British help, the, the Italians probably didn't have a big enough navy to do this, but any thought of taking a naval force and, and crossing the sea over here and attacking Austria is probably not a good, not a good, uh, <clears throat> a good scenario. Well. Let's talk just a little bit about the war in the Alps. I've already talked about the high positions. <clears throat> if you're used to being living at sea level, or very close to it, and then they march you up thousands of feet, sometimes this can be quite debilitating. Well, it takes a few weeks at the best for your body to, uh, uh, so we say, acclimatize to it. Then after a while, you don't feel a thing. Initially, this can be somewhat challenging. Let me tell you a story. Many years ago, I went to a history convention in Colorado, way up. I, I checked online. We were at 9,000 feet. So I live about 4,800 feet, and I went up to 9,000 feet. I didn't feel a thing. I was fine. I, oh, I had a great time. Even though it was in the spring, a lot of the reservoirs hadn't uh, yet had yet to lose their ice. In other words, it hadn't been warm enough to melt all the ice. Oh, I had such such fun one day. I was into big into walking, walking miles and miles. So I'm walking across this fro frozen reservoir. It was I had a great time. Anyway, we were up at the meetings, and this one gentleman there, and he looked pretty bad, looked kind of pale in the sky. And, and I said, "What's happening to you?" He says, "Well, you people from mountainous areas, you don't feel this, but I'm from Tennessee, and I'm having problems." Okay. Now he's obviously not a a 21-year-old man carrying a rifle. A little bit older than that, I would guess, probably middle-aged. But you can you see that there can be challenges at altitude, particularly if you're not used to it. We see something kind of interesting, which we don't really see at other fronts. <clears throat> For example, if you have a, a heavy shell, if you're going to bust through a position that's literally on a cliff face in these really granite areas up here, you're going to have to use some pretty heavy artillery pieces. And the artillery pieces are really designed not to explode easily, but to pound in and then explode if, if they, so they get knocked out pieces of rock. If you have a shell like this on the Western Front, where the soil is much deeper, and we'll talk about the Western Front in just a little while, when you have the shells coming in and, and you have explosive shell, it's going to do a lot of damage, but it's going to throw around a lot more dirt than rocks. In the war in the Alps, you actually come in, and because you are shattering stone when it's effective, these have those shards of stone go out, and they can be lethal devices if they strike a human being. As odd as this seems, we tend to see there are more casualties per heavy shells on the Italian front than we see on the Western front. We forget how bad the, the Austrians suffered in, in this high altitude fighting as well. 
But can we say, this is an agony of the Italian nation and something that actually finally breaks them. Now let's go in a slightly different direction right now. Let's talk about the war at sea. <clears throat> at the beginning of the war, the British, of course, have planned this out in advance in the event of the war, what shall we do? <clears throat> there are communication cables under the sea. There are communication cables that carry information across oceans. The first international cable going from North America to Britain was laid shortly after the Civil War. This always stuns me. I look at the Civil War and of course communication <clears throat> by telegraph was very frequently used, which are talking about wires on poles going from various places. One of the things Abraham Lincoln liked to do during the war, to get his latest reports from the, from the battlefronts, and this was near the White House, he'd walk over to the telegraph office, the Union Communications Center, shall we say, went over there and he'd listen to communiques that come in by telegraph. Now, that was cutting edge technology in the early 1860s, but in the late 1860s, we're laying cables literally across the North Atlantic. So now you could sit down with a teletype machine in the Eastern part of the United States, Boston, New York, whatever, tap out a message, and it'll show up, well, almost the speed of light, going across the Atlantic. You could imagine with that technology available in the 1860s, that by 1914, you have undersea cables in a lot of places. Now, the wireless had already been invented. This is sending out messages in the open. In other words, it's like a radio, it's, it's radio, really what it is. <clears throat> you send out radio, radio waves, and of course that can be picked up by anybody. If you send a cable, and let's say you have a, have a, a, a cable from Germany to Mexico, only the people that are on one end and the other end can actually read it. The British want to have the opportunity to intercept any communique, any communications coming out of Germany. And to do this, they're going to have to make sure that the Germans have to be able to send it in the open. Broadcast is going to be intercepted rather than going through a cable. So one of the first things, some books will say the first thing that Britain did when there's, when there's declaration of war before they deployed their troops or called out the fleet, they cut the cables. Got their trawlers out, I guess with hooks, pulled them up, cut the cables, so now the Germans can only communicate by air. Now, this is going to be important in more than one respect. It's going to be important as the Germans talk internationally. Of course, the most famous telegram of the entire war is the Zimmerman telegram, which helps, doesn't bring the United States into war. <clears throat> it helps bring the United States into war in 1917. So that's a factor Germans, the British can intercept. Less than two. If they can break the codes, then they can see what you're talking about. Let's look at the Navy a little bit. Now, the Germans are going to be using more than one naval code, which is me, more than one code they're going to broadcast out. Of course, submarines can't be communicated with even if the cables are available. The only way you can communicate with your ships at sea and also with submarines, which are also at sea, is by the use of codes you broadcast in the clear. Uh, the codes can be very, very complicated, but codes have to be complicated so the enemy can't easily read them. On the other hand, they can't be so complicated that the people receiving them cannot decipher them. Well, in August 1914, up in the Baltic Sea, <clears throat> the Baltic's up here, as you know. The North Sea here and the Baltic is up here. 
The Russians have their navy. Of course, Germany has its navy as well. Now, very fortunately for the German war effort, there is a Kiel Canal which had been virtually open just at almost the same time the war started. So now the Germans actually do have the opportunity of moving their ships from the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and back, for, back and forth. <clears throat> of course, one of the things the Germans want to do is to prevent the Russians from getting more supplies coming around here. Of course, the Germans aren't going to let the Russians use the Baltic Canal. The Baltic. Here I go, mispronouncing words. The Kiel Canal. Well, in any event, we have some naval operations very early in the war. The Russians versus the, the Germans. And the Russians have the better of a German vessel. Now, the code books have to be waterproof. <clears throat> if you want to have a code book at sea, it's a pretty good idea the water won't destroy it because there's a lot of water out there. So the German code books do have a tendency, I should say tendency, always are waterproof. <clears throat> now, the commander of the German ship knows she's going down. And he's concerned that the Russians might get hold of the naval code book. Now, you can just take the thing and throw it off to the side. However, he's in shallow water. If you have the code book in the shallow water, there's a, there's a much better chance they can, the Russians can go down and pull it up. So what the Russian, the German captain wants to do is this. He gives the code book to some guys. They're going to row out in a boat. You're going to row out, and you are going to drop the code book in water that's so deep that it cannot be easily retrieved, or maybe not retrieved at all. Of course, the Russians see what's going on, machine guns. They take out this small craft. When the Russians are, are pulling up bodies out of the sea a little while later, they find a corpse, a German corpse, in his arms is the code book. So they pull the code book out and they look at this and go, wow, German naval codes. So they send it to the British. Now, I'm not going to say that all the codes, all the naval codes, in use by the Germans are exactly the same code. There's a tendency for codes when, you, when you're in harbor going out and talking to the robot. No, I should call them tugs. They're pushing you around. <clears throat> but this is a major combat code. And the Germans, excuse me, the British are going to be able to use this to directly read the messages in that code. But the other codes, other naval codes, are going to have enough in similarity between this one code that there that helps them to get a good handle on the other naval codes. I'm making a big deal over this because this is going to make a big deal in naval war. The Germans are excuse me, the British are reading German naval codes. And later on, they're very, very clever men, they're breaking the German diplomatic codes as well. That's going to be important when we talk about the Zimmerman telegram. In the meantime, let's go on and talk about what's happening at sea. Remember the German fleet. Oh my goodness, all this money, <clears throat> enormous amounts of money. You pump all this money making all these battleships. Oh, they're very impressive. But they never outnumber the British. Remember, at the, finally at the last, the British are back off from two battleships in Britain versus one battleship that's German and go to a three to two ratio. Three Russian, excuse me, three British battleships and two German battleships. Even at that, the British have a lot more ships. Now, the German Navy's good. They don't have a very lengthy naval tradition, but, but they've been upgrading what they're doing. They're good, and they're making their ships out of very high quality steel. But what do you do? Well, the, the, the war begins, you have this fleet. It simply stays at home. See, the rationale for the German naval command is this. The Kaiser agrees. We send this out, it's going to get sunk. We really have never gotten to the point where we actually can threaten British naval power. So, yeah, we can take this out and run against the, the British fleet. 
uh, you simply outnumbered and you're getting blown away. So it stays at home. All that expense, all that time, where the money could have been used much better in other, in other matters. All that money, all that time, all that animosity, which was brought up between the British and Germans over this Navy, over this idiot naval arms race, means nothing because the Germans are afraid to use it. Well, there are the few raiders, I've already mentioned this in passing. There are a few German vessels that were not called home, and they're out playing away as far as, way, as the South Atlantic, and sometimes there's one or two even, even farther away than that. Uh, they're pretty easy to knock out. Yeah, they, they have some success in attacking commercial shipping. But within a matter of months, the British Navy, larger number of ships, uh, hunt them down and knock them out. So the surface war is not terribly important in, in, the, in the war itself. In 1916, the Battle of Jutland, which they place in the North Sea, we actually do see the one real major engagement between the British and the German home fleets. But that's down the road. So what can you do? What can the Germans do? The Germans have what they call U-boats, which is from the German for Unterseeboot, under sea boat. So we just call them U-boats. And, so, and we also can call them submarines. <clears throat> Germany has, particularly early in the war, but even later when they start to crank up their construction of their submarine fleet, they never ever do have as many U-boats as they need to put an effective blockade on Britain. They do damage. At times they do severe damage, but they never have enough. One thing I would like to mention is that at the beginning of the war, Britain actually has more submarines than does Germany. Well, it's a naval arm. It can be important. It can be effective. Yes, it can. So the British have a lot of these things. Now, we tend to think about the naval war, the, the, at least the U-boat war, taking place in the North Sea, but also in the Irish Sea and English Channel, largely around Britain. However, there are a few of these vessels that are even taken down in the Mediterranean. And a few of these uh, attack Italian shipping. Uh, can we say that's not nearly as significant as what happens in the North Sea? In saying that the British have actually a larger submarine fleet than do the Germans, uh, is not to say that the uh, British are able to use these as effectively as the Germans do. I mean, what are their what are their targets? Of course, if the battle fleet comes out, or the Germans send boats out to shell the coast of England, for example, the submarine can be effective. But we almost forget about them because they are not nearly as important in the war. Germany has too few. How do you engage the enemy at that time? Well, torpedoes and cannon, or cannons, artillery pieces. World War I and many World War II submarines have deck guns. They have, they have usually a forward gun. On the American vessels in the Second World War, this thing is a five-inch gun, so it's pretty formidable. Notice what we have. Can you see that right here? There's a deck gun. I mean, this is not a combat vessel. It is a combat vessel, but it's not a, not surface to surface. You're not going to take on a battleship with this thing because you're going to get annihilated. They're going to blow you out of the water. A lot of the shipping in the sec in the First World War, <clears throat> surface vessels, they, there's a lot of shipping or, or, or ships, transport vessels made out of made out of metal. 
However, even in during the First World War, there's a lot of trading vessels that are still made out of wood. You see, torpedoes are expensive, and you can only carry a few of these on a on a vessel. So you want to save a torpedo for a big target. But the vast majority of targets you're going to run into are small. They're merchant vessels. So you didn't have to attack these underwater because apparently, well, later on I'm going to talk about the Q-boats, but apparently they really are no threat to you. So what you do, you, you, you're, uh, most of the time the Germans actually spend time on the surface. This is not like World War II. If you spend a lot of time in the service, the British bombers will come around and find you with their radar and also reading the codes come down and attack you. They can spend a lot of time on the surface. If you're in shipping lanes, that can be a little dangerous in case you run into a battle wagon. But a lot of times they're on the surface. One of the reasons why you're on the surface, you go faster. When you're on the surface, you can run your diesel engines, which will recharge your batteries. So when you're under the water, your batteries are fully charged so you can continue to move. Now, if you run out of battery power underwater, you're not going anywhere. So mostly what you see is this. Most of the attacks of the war are this. The Germans surface. And if you're talking a wooden vessel or a transport vessel, it might be made out, made out of stone, made out of stone, made of iron. Uh, you simply can put a few rounds in it. You aim it at the water line so it sinks fast. Put a few rounds in there. And sometimes you give these people time to get off. Oh, by the way, we're sinking your vessel. If you run for it, we're going we're gonna to sink you anyway. So you can get in your rowboats, you can get off. So you come in, they put a few rounds right at the level, sea level, and you sink the vessel. Sometimes there's a little loss of life. Sometimes there's greater loss of life. But this is the main means by which you're actually engaging the enemy. Now, torpedoes. Torpedoes are a much more advanced technology than is a deck gun. What you have to have is, remember, you have to have, have a, 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 an engine in there. <clears throat> there has to be compressed air to make sure the, the engine will run properly. Um, you, you can only have so much throw weight. In other words, you have such a, a large mechanism for the motor and the tube itself that the actual warhead is not that large. Now, these things are expensive. The sub, they're large, so the submarines can't carry too many of them. Very often, the Germans only have in the forward torpedo here like four torpedo tubes, and sometimes only one or two torpedoes per tube. So if you're out on patrol, you have the opportunity to use these just a limited number of times. Now, something else, a deck gun, of course, you can see and fire. If you're firing at a vessel that's on the move, <clears throat> you're going to have to have some, some calculations. You're going to have to judge the speed of the vessel how the which in which direction the vessel is going and you're going therefore and you're going to have to judge the speed of course of your torpedo so you're going to have to aim these things so much in advance and hope that there's some that you haven't miscalculated in the length of time it takes to get there that something hasn't changed and you actually strike the vessel These are effective weapons. The torpedo is very good. On the other hand, it has its drawbacks. I already mentioned a few about aiming them, for example. One of which is that you almost have to have a direct 90 degree angle to strike your, uh, your enemy ship for, that, for it to go off and be effective. If you hit it at an angle, there's a good chance the torpedo might not go off, just bounce off. Or if you hit an angle, the explosion will not go directly into the vessel. It will actually, shall we say, push off the side of the vessel. It, it could do damage, but it might not do a significant damage uh, to sink the vessel, to, to put a hole in it. So there's, there's these technical as aspects of the war. Well, how effective is this going to be? It's never really been tried. 
as we look at the U, Unterseeboot, as they can, as the British, excuse me, the German Navy constructs these things, they count up. U9 is the ninth one they had made. Well, there's old British cruisers in the North Sea. <clears throat> I believe it's actually close to the English Channel. And the U9 comes up in periscope, looks out, it's got, well, there's a target. It's a cruiser. <clears throat> Later on in the war, the Germans are going to be much more reluctant to attack cruisers because they can retaliate and come and get you. Um, it's an easy shot. Now, remember when I was reading about this back when I was in high school, the first time I read about this attack, the article I was reading in the historical magazine was saying that, oh, by the way, the German system was so crude early in the war that they didn't know if they fired a torpedo. You see, you lose weight when the torpedo goes out. You fire two and three or four torpedoes, the weight goes down considerably. So depending on how you how far you are down up, there's the fear that if you fire these torpedoes, you'd pop to the surface because the weight of the vessel would go down. Your buoyancy would remain high, so you go boing. That's not a good situation to be in if you're around combat vessels. I was impressed with that for one thing. Then I got thinking, well, Germans can do the math. <laughs> they sir, if you're down so far and you weigh so much and you lose a certain amount of mass, when the torpedoes can come out, you can judge, can you not, <laughs> how high you're going to go up. It made for a good paragraph in the article. Reality, I do have doubts about that. Any anyway, let's go back to the story. The Germans take out a cruiser. Boom. And wow, good shot. Torpedoes worked. Now then the, then the British make another, make a big mistake, big mistake. They notice that there are, this ship has been hit. Of course, your men are on there. It's going to go down. We want to go pick up the survivors. These guys flounder around. They're probably going to drown. Not all of them can get into a boat. So other vessels, this is the mistake, other vessels come over to try to help them. And they come over trying to help them. They stop in the water to start picking people up. The German submarine's still out there. You don't even have to lead these things. They're sitting ducks. Bam, bam, they take out two more. How can you avoid this kind of thing happening to the British? Well, one of the ways you can do this is zigzag. Remember, you have to lead a vessel if you're in a German submarine. If the vessel's going the same direction, at the same velocity, same speed, you simply Try to measure the distance and the speed and the speed of your torpedo and you lead it. What if you vary the speed? They don't do that very much, actually, because in, uh, you're on a vessel, you vary the speed, the momentum can shift. So sometimes it's difficult to, to change your momentum, uh, your speed very much at all. But zigzag. If you, of course, are zigzagging, in a predictable manner, well, then they can lead you as well. On the other hand, you know, two to the left, one to the right kind of thing. Now, if you're on, on the vessel and you're going like this every time it zigzags, that can be fairly uncomfortable. But you're not worried about your men's comfort. Zigzagging probably would have prevented this. And then there's the other issue. Coming on over and picking people up when the, when the submarine is still right there. You have no reason to believe it's gone. You see, you learn, you still pick up men, but you're not going to stand there with a combat vessel, almost dead in the water, to do this. You get smaller vessels nearby, or you get nearby and put your men on boats. You get your ship out of harm's way, but your men on boats can come in and pick, rowboats boats, can come in and pick up the people. So there's a learning curve, and the British learn this pretty rapidly. Well, initially, the Germans are attacking vessels of, of numerous countries. <clears throat> However, they don't really want to start sinking a lot of U.S. ships. Simple reason for that is, why aggravate the Americans? And maybe the Americans will send additional aid to the British. They're already sending industrial goods over, over to the British. And why, why egg them into the possibility of going to war? 
Now, when the British are on the high seas, the British vessels, these are trading vessels, not always combat. Trading vessels, you're flying the British flag. You get to the area around Britain where you know submarines are operating, and you pull out, you take down your British flag, and you pull up uh, an American flag. Well, of course, the British are going to figure, excuse me, the Germans are going to figure this out pretty rapidly. So when you see a vessel from the submarine, and you see it's flying the American flag, you know it's an American ship, or you know, is it a British ship trying to fool you? A lot of times, the German submarines do attack these vessels flying neutral flags. Now, of course, some of those are going to actually be British flags flying, flying the American flag. But some of those are going to be American vessels flying American flags. Inadvertently, therefore, the Germans are going to start sinking American vessels, which has the potential of angering the Americans. No doubt about that at all. Of course, the Americans know what's going on. And they tell the British, we ought to, you ought to quit doing this. See, one of the reasons for this, one of the reasons why the Americans early in the war, first month, first year or so, are not as angry about the British, uh, the German submarine attacks, is that they do realize that some sometime Americans are being baited into, their, excuse me, the British are baiting the German submarines into attacking American ships. The U.S. protests the British, but that doesn't really make much difference. <clears throat> now, you're on a vessel, the German submarine surfaces to sink you. If you're on a sailing vessel, they still use sailing vessels in 1914. On a sailing vessel, it's very hard to maneuver to hit the German submarine. However, if you're on a steam vessel, and that is the heavy majority of ships at this time frame, if you're on a steam vessel, and the Germans come up to you to sink you with a deck gun, give you a warning to get off, the British are under orders, even merchant commercial vessels, to attack the German submarine by ramming it. Submarines are, are hard to maneuver. It's simply the nature of them. Even on the surface, they're very low in the water. Water has more resistance. Because they're a relatively small vessel, they can't move very fast. It's hard for them to maneuver. It's much easier for a merchant vessel to maneuver. So you come up, come up and boom. You see, it becomes more and more difficult for the Germans to surface, to give warning. Because there are vessels, there are German submarines, that are rammed by British merchantmen. Submarines, by their nature, have to have a very thin hull. You can't have a thick hull because it weighs too much. You have a thick hull and you go underwater, you're just going to keep on going. It has to be thin. It has to be easily vulnerable by ramming or by an artillery piece when you're on the surface. The British start using what we call a Q-ship. Q-ship is a merchant vessel. If you look at it through a periscope, you see a merchant vessel. It looks like a regular old merchant vessel. But there's a deck gun on. Now, the deck gun is down a little lower, so you can't see it. So if you come up to give warning, we're going to sink your vessel, time to get off. Not only are you the run, running the risk of being rammed, but they could bring that gun up. Remember, the submarine cannot take a hit and survive. If you fire at a battle wagon, you fire at a battleship, a cruiser, you can put a dent in it, but it's going to keep on going. Literally, when you talk about cruisers and battleships, you almost have to pound them into rubble unless you hit the powder magazine and blows up. Other than that, you have to pound it into rubble. Submarine, hit it once and it's gone. Hit it anywhere and it's going down. So the Q ships and ramming, it just becomes too dangerous for the Germans to surface and give warning before the attack. The most famous submarine attack of the war is when the U-20 German submarine attacks the Lusitania and sinks her on May the 7th, 1914. Let's go to Lusitania here. If 
She's a big ship. It's like over 1,800, excuse me, over 800 feet long. Looks a little bit like the Titanic. The Titanic had four boiler mass, four boiler stacks. Uh, obviously, they're burning coal, so you have to have a, 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 the ability for the smoke to escape. It's a very big vessel. And she's off the coast of Ireland. Can I put a location where she sank? Okay, well, I was hoping to do better than this. Yeah, here we are, the wrong maps again. It's right off the coast of Ireland out here. You see, she's going for liver for excuse me for Bristol. It's right over here, major port on the west side. Now, during the war, London, as you know, is and there are other important ports on the east side as well. During peacetime, you can bring trading vessels up the Thames River, and there's docks in London at that time. Well, the major places where you're bringing in materiel and ships. Let's get the Irish Sea up here. Maybe that'd be better. Well, maybe, yeah, I need a little bit, shall we say, longer distance out here. Let's look at that one. All right. Liverpool's a major port up here. Bristol's a major port down here. <clears throat> if you're coming from Canada to the United States, you can come up here and go over and land at Liverpool, or you can come to the south south coast of Ireland, off the south coast of Ireland, and come down over here. You can go to Cardiff as well, but most of them are going to Bristol. So the Lusitania is taking the route just south of Ireland down here and shows she's sunk off the Irish coast in this area. <clears throat> Just days before the Lusitania left harbor in New York, the British embassy publishes in New York newspapers a warning. All Americans be warned that there's a war going on between the United States, excuse me, I said that wrong, between Great Britain and Germany. And there's, a, there's it's dangerous, you go into a war zone, there's a possibility you're going to be sunk. Now, does this mean that the Germans had foreseen that the Lusitania would be sunk? I don't think that's the case at all. I think that the, the dates are really quite, quite accidental. However, the Germans clearly know that there's going to be some vessels that are going to be sunk as they continue. So not only just commercial vessels, but liners that carry people are going to be sunk. Lusitania is a big ship. Now, the U-20 has been operating in this area. The British know about this, of course. She's sunk a few vessels. <clears throat> uh, a little hard to track. I'll come back and talk about that a little bit later. And so the Lusitania did have the opportunity of, well, going up here. <clears throat> At that time, there's really no German submarines. The, the British know they're operating up here. Well, but this is a straight shot. It's a little bit faster. This is going to slow you down somewhat. And then the U-20 looks out of its looks out of its periscope and sees this huge ship. Now the captain claimed he didn't know what it was, but he knows it's obviously British and obviously very big. And it's an easy shot. One torpedo. Remember, this vessel is huge. It's very, very large. One torpedo hits the side of the vessel. Just for just before the middle section. It strikes it right there. How big would a hole would, would a torpedo make in a vessel? It could be like this, it could be somewhat bigger. But it's not huge. Not like you can drive a bus through there or anything like that. So the explosion, bam, goes in. It, well, there's a secondary explosion. 
initially, the British had thought that the U-20 hit the Lusitania with two torpedoes. But the captain only fired one. There's really no question it was one torpedo. The secondary explosion on the ship, quite frankly, is some is a subject of controversy. No one has ever a, a, been able to actually explain to everybody's satisfaction, shall we say, what had happened. One of the theories is that when they punched the 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 uh, hole in that, of course, water came rushing in and hit the boilers, the boilers that are running the vessel. And having this water, cold water, hit the boilers, the boiler exploded. That's clearly possible, but how cold is the water? It's not like it's terribly cold. Just a few years earlier, in 1912, the, the Titanic struck an iceberg. And water came pouring in, and rather than exploding when it hit the boilers, the boilers just simply got put out. The water is warmer, probably in the 50 degree weather, 50 degree range. See, the Titanic, the water near the Titanic was 28 degrees, below freezing. Because there's impurities in the water, salt. Water does not freeze at 32 degrees. It will freeze at lower temperatures. So the difference is, what, 30 degrees here? Warmer water hitting the boilers, they'd actually explode. Well, it's certainly within the realm of possibility, but can we say, some people look at this and say, that that's not very likely. What else could have exploded? Well, we do know that the Lusitania was carrying munitions. There is something which they call gun cotton. And gun cotton was very used in naval mines. When you use gun cotton, uh, gun cotton will actually explode if you get water on it. Did they hit gun cotton? If it was actually munitions that exploded, you would actually think that maybe when the initial explosion came in, that it would actually ignite the powder more readily. You see, we're not sure about this second, secondary explosion. There's more than one possibility. And none of them actually gives us a complete explanation of what might could have happened. Okay, the Lusitania goes down in 18 minutes. Whoa. A hole how big? Of course, the secondary explosion could have enlarged the hole, possibly. Or it could have just been an internal explosion. But... I mean, if you got even if you had a very, very big hole right here, 10, 12 feet wide, whatever, is that enough to sink this vessel in 18 minutes? You see, the Titanic struck an iceberg uh, April 14th, 1912. The reason why the Titanic went down, you know, I love to do this in my classes. I say, why did the Titanic sink? You people are so good. There's always somebody who knows. The Titanic came across. It hit the iceberg. If I had hit it straight on, probably just ended it in and not sank the ship. But since the vessel was trying to turn to avoid it, it scraped the side of the Titanic, coming down the scraped side. There were five compartments designed to keep it from flooding. If it had only scraped three of these compartments, it probably would have stayed afloat. But since it scraped all five, so there's water coming in all five compartments. In reality, they'll fill up one compartment as she tends down. They'll fill up one compartment and then the water will go from one compartment to the other compartment. That's why she goes down about first because the weight filling up the water fills up rapidly. You see, they have these compartments, but they're not watertight. You see, it's just supposed to fill up to a certain level. If you have something that's watertight, not only do you have these areas to contain the water, but now you have something on top. On top. So it's actually a compartment that is literally sealed off. If you, if you 
hit a torpedo in one of those compartments, which is what happened. You're going to fail that compartment, then what do you do? You're not going to sink. After the Titanic went down, there's all kinds of people looking at all kinds of ships and what went wrong. I'm sure you know that there was not enough life vests for people. I'm sure you know that there was not enough boats to get people off. All that's been rectified. And also, these compartments are now completely sealed off. The Titanic, much more severely damaged, took two hours and 40 minutes to sink. The Lusitania goes down in 18 minutes. One of the problems why, why some of the loss of life was so high on the Lusitania was because going down so fast, people did not have the opportunity to react to get on their life vests. Sometimes when they did so, they put them on improperly or to get on the boats. So a lot of people are in the water. There's close to 2,000 people on the vessel. How many die? 1,198. There are pathetic experiences, you know, men and women, little babies drown. Maybe dozen score little babies die. Among these 128 Americans, the rest of these are probably British citizens <clears throat> going to Britain for whatever reason. 128 Americans. The furor on this is huge. Let me come back and talk about that in just one minute. Well, let's look at her as a viable target. Now, according to maritime law, according to maritime law, an enemy can attack an opposing vessel if it's carrying munitions. The United States, even as early as 1914, was supplying Britain with munitions. A lot of these are going to go to France as well. I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more when we're talking about the shell shortage. So we do know it's carrying small arms fire, you know, bullets. It's carrying ar artillery pieces. It's not artillery pieces, but actually artillery shells that the uh, Germans are going to be able to use. Excuse me, I keep saying this wrong. The British are going to be able to use. So according to national law, it's a viable target. Of course, when the commander of the U-20 looks out his periscope and sees the Lusitania, he doesn't know that. Well, so by international law, you can hit it. The British should not have had munitions on a luxury liner. Well, let's look at some of the controversies here. Now, the British knew there was a sub in the area. Why did they know that? Well, got several reasons. The U-20 had been out here and it sank a few commercial vessels. So they knew there was a sub in the area. One book I read on this said that the Germans, being very punctual people, they would call in by radio to the command back in Germany every four hours. By triangu triangulation, the British have listening posts in Ireland and Britain. So you have a, any vessel out here. And so you catch the direction from which this is broadcasting their information to keep in contact back here in Germany. By triangulation here and here, you know where it's at. Now, of course, it's on the move. When I found this out, I thought it was quite remarkable. Do the Germans really want to give up their positions every four hours? According to the book, they did. And according to the book as well, that the Germans very frequently would report what they're doing, where they're going. Since the British were reading the German naval codes, not only did they know where the vessels were, but they knew where they were heading. So they knew the pre precise, almost exact location of all the German submarines. I, I don't want to argue with the historian very easily, but I'm saying I've got to be skeptical about this. If the British actually knew where the submarines were at any given time, how do you explain the fact that they, that they don't take precautions and make sure that no vessels are nearby? However, this is one of the theories. 
They knew there was, a, at least they knew there was a sub in the area. <clears throat> Does not give protection. Remember, going back, submarines do not want to attack powerful vessels. Because if you don't take them down, they can turn around and they can make things very uncomfortable for you. This is a big ship, a lot of people on board. There were, remember, Ireland is owned by Britain this time frame. So they have the opportunity, largely over here at Cork, but you have the opportunity now to bring out ships to escort, to accompany this major ship as it crosses the dangerous areas here. But the British failed to give protection. The British, of course, are sending in. The captain is, is saying, what shall I do? Um, he was ordered to reduce speed. Why? Why would you want to reduce speed? And the, I don't have it here, but the, 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 the commander, the captain who survived, stated that he was given an order not only to reduce speed, but to change directions fairly slightly, which accidentally or on purpose tended to put him right in a 90 degree angle in front of that submarine. Now, I, I, I have a tendency to believe that, but that this did, did, wasn't really a setup, but I don't have an explanation as to why the orders would have been given at least to slow down. Now, the vessel's not zigzagging. Remember, we learned how to do this already. The vessel is not zigzagging. Um, okay. <laughs> Why wouldn't you zigzag? Well, you're on a passenger liner. How uncomfortable is this? You're sitting there, you're having your tea, whatever you're doing, and the vessel goes, mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. And, well, maybe to save their lives, you maybe could have convinced them it's a pretty good idea. On the other hand, for their comfort, essentially don't zigzag. We say this, this is a major, a major problem. And of course, had it been zigzagging, there would have been no viable attack. Why did it sink so fast? I talked about some of the theories about the second explosion up here. The windows, there's portholes on the vessel. Uh, and they're open. They're left open. Why would this be? Remember, the, the temperatures are in the 50s. Why do I know that? The water temperature is in the 50s. And usually if you're at sea, the temperature of the air has a tendency to be very similar to the temperature of the, uh, of the water. Is it a little cold? Yeah, it's a little cold. Most people sitting around 50 degrees would rather be in the cabin than be up on deck. The portholes are left open. You would normally think, well, shouldn't it, shouldn't it have been closed? Now, there's a, these are not all the controversies. But you start scratching your head, a series of mistakes are being made here, which allow this disaster to take place. Uh, questions, uh, the conspiracy theorists state, that was this a setup to get the United States in, at war? One book I read on this. And I'm kind of into Winston Churchill. I've read a number of biographies. And some of these are multi volumes biographies, like William Manchester's. Why is it three volumes? And uh, so you get into in common detail on the nature of his life. Very interesting man. An understanding of Winston Churchill during the war, obviously, understanding of him helps us understand the war better. First World War, and of course, the Second World War. I've not seen this in any biography, but I did see this in a book about. Winston Churchill, uh, excuse me, about the, the, the Lusitania. He's the first Lord of the Admiralty, and the information, such as reduced speed, is sent from the Office of the Navy, where he's in control, to the Lusitania. Okay, that doesn't surprise me. However, according to this book, Winston Churchill, when he'd given the orders, immediately got on a train went down here to the coast, 
took a boat over to France and checked into a hotel in their assumed name. So he's, he's out of communication. He doesn't cheat on his wife. He's as faithful as they come. He's not meeting Fifi in Paris for a little romp. Why is he doing this? I don't know. Is it suspicious? I think so. Even yet, the war has been over for a century. More than a century. Are some of the documents still unavailable? There have been researchers researching the Lusitania. And they go into the British archives and they find that sometimes the essential communiques that were supposed to be available at that time frame somehow have been mispl misplaced. They also say that you go in and see books of logs, for example, for information of what was done. And you see some pages have been clipped out. Um, accidental? Hiding something? It's just suspicion. Back in the 60s, when I'm, I'm a kid, I remember reading about the declassification of materials from Britain from the First World War. Now, in many countries, including the United States, we have what we call a declassification schedule, which means that in using the United States declassification is 30 years. For example, many of the secrets in the Second World War, such as we were reading the German code, were made available in the 1970s because declassification 30 years, now the, the information becomes available. I was interested in the Korean War a number of years ago, living back, going to graduate school, the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And I'm doing research on the Korean War. And this is in the 70s. And I asked to see some documents. There were accusations that the United States had used gas warfare in the Korean War. I wanted to see if there's anything to that. There was not. But I remember talking to these people and saying, well, <clears throat> can I see the documents? No, they're still classified. So they'd be classified until the early 1980s. And I said, well, why don't we come back here in years and see this again? They said, well, it's not quite that easy. Not only are they, there's the declassification schedule, <clears throat> 30 years. <clears throat> But you have to have somebody to classify them. So I guess it's not automatic everything. Anyway, reading this article in the newspaper, the declassification of British documents is 50 years, not 30 years by the time, it's 50 years. So in the 1960s, there should be documents declassified that talk about World War I. When I was reading this, the British have said, oh, by the way, we're changing the declassification schedule to 150 years. What I don't remember, or what was not made clear, was it 150 years after the war, or was it 150 years after the 1960s when I was reading about that? In either case, I won't be alive. You as young people, I, I, I ask you if you are interested, exercise, eat right get enough sleep. I want you to live long enough that you can be around to see perhaps in the 2060s if these kind of things are made available. I will be long dead by that time frame. Now, having said this, I don't know if these documents are really dealing with the Lusitania. They might be. There could be other issues that the British are a little embarrassed about showing. Can we say the information then from the First World War is not going to give aid and comfort to our enemies? Because I'm sure who are, who's British enemies nowadays, I'm not sure. I guess resurgent Russia, there's potential hot spots in the world. But if these documents are made available, I don't think that's going to change security in the nation in any real sense. On the other hand, they might be protecting the British people from knowledge about their government, which made the government look bad. You see, the British even today are largely obsessed with the First World War. And you even see in newspapers, slaves in the 1980s and 90s, 
obituaries about someone's father or grandfather that was killed in the First World War. I think if it was anything embarrassing coming about the First World War, it would, it would not do the British government any good. Well, there's enormous outcry. Am I out of time? Got a few more minutes. The outcry, remember 120 Americans are killed. It almost leads to war. My goodness, the Americans are furious. Look what you have done. They've attacked this innocent vessel. Remember, it's not so innocent. You attack this innocent vessel. This is blatant murder. You're murdering Americans on the high seas. This, Americans are very upset. This is a very big deal. I remember seeing a political cartoon from 1914 when Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, refused to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. They actually had a political cartoon of a human spine, a human backbone there. And underneath it says, what is lacking in Washington, D.C.? We have no backbone. Had the Republicans renominated Teddy Roosevelt in 1912 to run for president? And he, I think had he had the Republican nomination, he would have won. As I'm sure many of you know, he, he they didn't nominate him, so he bolted and did the Bull Moose Party thing. Uh, which divided the Republican Party, which meant that a Democrat would, would go Wilson would win. Had the Republicans nominated Teddy Roosevelt, I think it would have been very easy for him to win the 1912 election, which meant he would have been president of the United States in 1915. And this guy is absolutely furious. He's got venom in his veins. My goodness, let's go to war. And he's screaming and shouting, Wilson dodges the pressure. However, had Teddy Roosevelt been president of the United States. I have no doubt that he would have gone directly to Congress and asked for a declaration of war, and I think he would have got it. So the United States would have came in in 1915 rather than 1917. Could have made a very big difference in actually the course of the war. We'll talk about U.S. neutrality later on. Um, one of the better accounts, one of the best accounts, I've ever read by a U.S. soldier during the First World War was by a book by Arthur Guy M.P., and it's called Over the Top. When he heard about the sinking of the Titanic, oh, by the way, he's from Ogden, Utah. At least he was from Ogden, Utah at that time. He looked at the newspaper and saw that the Germans had sunk the Lusitania. He says, I'm not taking this anymore. That the United States is in the war. So he went to Britain and he volunteered for the British Army. He's deployed in combat starting in 1915 till he's severely wounded in combat in 1916. His account is very, very good. They actually made a silent motion picture about his military experiences. Very unfortunately, a lot of the films from the silent era do not survive. They were recorded on highly flammable materials. And over the years, there's been many fires in repositories. So a lot of these no longer exist. But, but I would love to have seen that film to see how they depicted things. I read someplace that like 80% of all the silent films no longer exist. Last time we were talking about the Armenian genocide, and I showed you a still from the motion picture of women being crucified. We can't see the film. It doesn't exist. Well, in any event, there are Americans that join. The Americans simmer down after a while. However, this is a background issue that when the Germans do other things that are, that, shall we say, are egging on the Americans, the Americans are going to remember, remember the Lusitania. Oh, another one. And finally in 1917. They decide to go to war. I'm out of time. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I really got into it. I'm sorry about that. But we will discuss, start discussing the Western Front next time. In the meantime, live long and prosper.